Well, thank you. Um, I want to start off by thanking the organizers for this opportunity to give a little introduction to my lab today. Um, so my name is Lorraine Leon, and I'm an assistant professor in material science and engineering. And I direct what I call the biomolecular engineering laboratory. And you can see some contact information here. We're mildly active on Twitter. I mainly use that to promote some of my students' papers. Um, but I've actually found it a quite a good resource. So for some of you academics that haven't <laughs> joined up, I find a, like a lot of different papers and stuff that I wouldn't have stumbled upon just by um, following different people on Twitter, which I found quite fortunate. Anyway, so a little bit about myself. I'm a chemical engineer by training. Um, I have an undergraduate degree from the University of Florida. Um, and a PhD from the City College of New York. And I did postdoctoral work at what was then called the Institute for Molecular Engineering at both Argonne National Lab and the University of Chicago. So at Argonne, the nice thing there was the ability to place some pretty fancy toys. Um, and I guess another thing I'll say about myself, I'm a native of Chile. Um, and moved around a lot as a kid and found myself in Florida. And now I find myself at UCF again, um, so back in Florida. Um, and I've been here yeah, as an assistant professor in material science since 2017. I'm also affiliated with the Nanoscience and Technology Center. And the reason for that is mainly we developed some nanoparticles I'll talk about today um, and some other you know, shared interests. In terms of teaching and education, uh, my expertise is mainly in soft materials um, so polymers and biomaterials. And so for that reason, I teach a lot of classes focused on that. Grad classes in polymer science and engineering, undergraduate classes in um, polymer science as well. I'm also a chemical engineer by training. So I was tasked with teaching transport phenomena, uh, which was the, the first time was this last spring. So I think that's the first time transport phenomena has been offered at the University of Central Florida. So that was exciting. Um, I also teach introductory classes like structure and properties of materials. And I was part of the group um, that helped launch the undergraduate program in material science and engineering. And that launched in fall of 2019. So relatively young program. In terms of my interests, and you'll see these scattered throughout the rest of this presentation, right? I work with um, peptide-based materials where we design and synthesize different peptides, um, characterize them and use them for a variety of applications. Uh, the heart of our design is based on self-assembly, right? So we like to design molecules that, you know, are programmed to form specific shapes and have specific functions. And I'll talk about that today. Uh, work a lot with polymers and polyelectrolyte complexes, which are the interactions of charged polymers. Um, and the versatile materials that they can um, form and their different applications. I also have interests in biotemplating and biominimalization. This is essentially, um, you know, essentially how proteins can direct the growth of inorganic material. And so nature does this fantastically well. We are learning how to do this better and better every day, but there's still a lot of work to be done. And in terms of uh, characterization, um, a lot of my focus is on uh, soft materials characterization uh, for different types of polymeric and biomaterials and advanced characterization techniques like small angle scattering. So in general, um, our lab is motivated by nature, right? Nature has very, very robust materials. These materials are dynamic. And, the, and adaptable. And of course, they've had millions of years of evolution to create these really amazing structures, right? And the way they, the way nature does this is it relies on multivalent molecular interactions to create these dynamic structures. And in doing so, they actually, you know, are, most of this comes down to proteins, right? If you ask most people, the most important biomolecule, they'll say DNA and RNA. In my view, that's incorrect, right? The best thing those molecules do is create proteins. Proteins do all the work. They are the workhorse. Um, and 
my work um, has a lot to do with trying to mimic protein function with more simple materials. And those are peptides. Peptides are just small proteins. Um, and unlike proteins that are hard to synthesize and hard to engineer, we can design peptides with any type of molecular interaction we want. Um, and they have, you know, kind of they're in between polymers and proteins where you have, you know, a very easy, robust synthesis for polymers, um, a very complex one for proteins, but peptides are kind of a happy medium where you have that biofunctionality, you have that ability to design specific sequences, but you're not um, limited by the way they're synthesized. And so um, one of the specific motivations I'll focus on today in our lab where, you know, biomaterials is a vast space is these dynamic intracellular droplets called membraneless organelles. And so I'll show you a video here. These are droplets found within cells and they can form and dissipate um, dynamically. They form for a variety of different functions and structures. I'll talk briefly about one, but you know, they were, they're kind of a little bit of a hot topic in biology because now that we have these advanced um, micro, uh, microscope techniques, we can actually see them. Since they were transient, they weren't really a focus, um, you know, over 20 years ago. And so the neat thing about these is that they are concentrated droplets of protein. This specific one I'm showing you here, I'll play the movie again, um, is called the nucleolus. And it assembles the ribosome, which is the cellular machinery that, assemble, that um, makes protein. Um, from the inside out. And so there's different layers of liquids and it knows to assemble enzymes in these unique ways where they exclude everything they don't need. They perform their chemical reactions. They do this super efficiently and then the whole thing falls apart. So it's a really, really fascinating material science problem. It's also a very, very fascinating reactor. And so in our lab, we're really fascinated by these droplets we uh, want to know how they form, what molecular interactions dictate they, their formation. And um, essentially, you know, we know they're formed by proteins. They're proteins that are called intrinsically disordered proteins that form them. Um, but it's, you know, not super understood what molecular interactions drive them and also how they fall apart and respond to stimuli. And so overall, we are interested in self-assembly and starting to incorporate different types of molecular interactions. Most people that focus on self-assembly or kind of in the past have stuck to one thing using something like hydrophobicity to drive self-assembly or electrostatic interactions. Uh, what we're trying to do is kind of diversify that toolbox to have different multivalent interactions and start approaching these um, more biologically relevant uh, situations. So I'll start talking about one of the more fundamental projects that's led to a lot of different projects in our lab. Um, and this is trying to make these droplets um, synthetically. Um, so you can make these liquid-like droplets that look just like those biological structures I showed you by mixing oppositely charged polymers, but we don't fundamentally know what happens when you start um, engineering different interactions into them. And so we've done things like add um, hydrophobic residues from the diversity of the different um, amino acids you can put in a sequence. Um, and we've also added things containing aromatic groups so you can take advantage of pi-pi interactions. Um, and so in doing so, we've found a lot of different things. Um, you can improve the stability of these droplets using hydrophobicity and pi interactions. And you can also tune the phase behavior. So here you can see these liquid droplets with this that are formed. And here you see these kind of irregularly shaped aggregates. These are actually quite similar to some aggregates you see in disease states, things like amyloid fibers. And there's a whole other interest of mine related to that. But you can tune between these materials these liquid droplets that have all these great properties um, and these solid ones 
by manipulating these interactions. And so we have several publications in this area. Um, my student, Sarah, has synthesized around 18 new peptides, allowing her to study this in detail. We're using these materials to encapsulate hydrophobic drugs um, for a drug delivery angle. We're also um, controlling the phase behavior with manipulation of chirality, which is something you can do with peptide molecules as well. Um, and we have active collaborations with people that do molecular simulations. Um, so we can, you know, kind of combine our characterization methods um, at the molecular level to see if they match up with things that we quite can't, we, we can't quite probe yet. So using these um, advances, we've actually started to try to simulate multi-phase liquid droplets like the nucleolus does. And so here we're trying to make a synthetic nucleolus and you might be asking why you really care. Um, the reason is the enzymes. Um, enzymes are nature's catalysts. They make fuels, pharmaceuticals, fine chemicals in a green and renewable manner. Um, they're highly selective, but they currently account for only about 11% of the chemical market. And the reason for that is that usually enzymes work together in nature in complex pathways called cascades, but those cascades or those kind of multi-enzyme uh, pathways are incompatible with industrial processing. So what we're trying to do is kind of mimic these structures so we can start um, putting enzymes in different phases and create a platform so we can increase the capacity of using enzymes in industry. And so this work uh, was recently awarded a NSF Career Award earlier this year. Um, and we we're just starting out, we've made the different phases, we're putting enzymes in them, and we're seeing if we can control the kinetics of these enzyme reactions, um, first with model systems, and then hopefully moving on to some more uh, complex systems as well. And lastly, what I'll talk about, and I think running a little bit out of time, <laughs> is that you can make these materials, um, these droplets on the nanoscale. You can do that with some molecular engineering. You tether the uh, charged blocks to neutral blocks, and you make these nanoparticles um, that can encapsulate nucleic acids and proteins remarkably well. Um, so. The beauty of that, right, is um, in the delivery of biologics, which are nucleic acids, proteins. Um, and I'm sure most of you are you know, very familiar at this point with the microRNA COVID vaccines. Um, they deliver nucleic acids extremely well, but their huge bottleneck is uh, the lipids involved. They have a, an ionizable uh, lipid that is the proprietary difference, for example, between the Moderna vaccine and the um, Pfizer vaccine. And that's the bottleneck in synthesis. That's what's taking up um, all the resources in trying to produce these materials. And that's um, uh, why you can't make more of it cheaper. But polymers are a lot easier to, um, to produce and to synthesize. And so we're interested in these types of particles because of their ability to deliver nucleic acids. Um, we do a lot of structural characterization of these materials. We can make them spheres and worms. We can put nucleic acids in them. We can make them respond, respond to temperature. Um, and we've done a lot of characterization using partnerships um, from the Advanced Neutron Source at Oak Ridge National Lab, uh, William Heller, and also at Argonne National Lab as part of the uh, APS we do a lot of uh, small angle scattering, which is pictured here. And there's some papers on this you can follow as well. So with that, um, I'm going to conclude. I actually think I went a little over time, um, but you can see our funding sources here. This is a recent image of our, of our group and our collaborators. Um, but mostly I'd like to thank Sarah Tabande and Sasha Shah. They're the first two graduate students in my lab and they are um, the reason that we've developed a lot of these different technologies. So happy to take any questions.